All right, gentlemen, we're going to begin Chapter 29 and look at the Civil Rights Movement, uh, primarily the Civil Rights Movement from the mid-50s through the late 60s. Uh, if you really want to get technical, the Civil Rights Movement covers a little bit more ground in American history, but most historians focus on that, you know, roughly 15-year period where it was, it was really um, front-page news and, and a more united... Um, and definable movement, I guess, is a way to put it. You know, there were a lot of, of people you could point to, events you could point to, not just kind of a vague idea, but something that you could really identify. I mean, for example, uh, one of the people up here, W.E.B. Du Bois, the man who helped start the NAACP, I mean, he is from, um, you know, the late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, he was he was deceased by the time, you know, Brown v. Board was ruled on by the United States Supreme Court, but he is considered, you know, one of the early voices in the civil rights movement. Uh, you obviously have Dr. King, Rosa Parks, um, and this is Malcolm Little, who you will probably know better as Malcolm X as we get moving along. But let's go ahead and get started. Um, the origins of the whole issue or debate, if you want to come at it from a legal standpoint, is the 1896 case of Plessy v. Ferguson. We actually talked about this previously in this class. In 1896, there was a Supreme Court case. Uh, Homer Plessy um, was a mixed-race individual, um, but under Louisiana state law, he was considered uh, black. Negro is actually the term that they used. Um, and because of that, under Louisiana state law, he had to ride in the, um, in the Negro rail car. And he did not do so. He wanted to ride in the white rail car, um, or the white's only rail car, which of course was in better condition. Um, <clears throat> eventually his case made to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court ruled, nope, you can have, and the famed wording was separate but equal, right? This is the birth of the old, you can have separate but equal facilities. And thus was born legal segregation in this country, right? Now to enforce the Plessy decision, you had laws passed in all the southern states, and again, we talked about this previously, known as Jim Crow laws. These were the actual laws that, that established, you know, schools and, and swimming pools and buses and everything else, you know, as to how it would be segregated, what the rules would be, et cetera. You know, because you can't just say, oh, you're allowed to have separate but equal. You actually have to have laws that draw it out, that define it, right? And that was the purpose of the Jim Crow laws. Now, Jim Crow laws were common throughout the South, but there was segregation in other parts of the country, okay? This is where you get into the um, idea of what we call de jour segregation, which would be segregation through law. But there's also what we call de facto segregation. And again, we have talked about this in this class, but there were many parts of America where segregation existed. It wasn't law. It was just custom, tradition. It was understood. Um, it was not just, you know, the southern United States or the southeastern United States, the old Confederate states. You know, it's where you get the phrase, the wrong side of the tracks. Um, you know, there was, the, I think I've said it before, if you've watched the film, Remember the Titans, there is that scene um, where I believe the character's named Julian, um, the African-American linebacker, He's, um, he's walking in the neighborhood, the white neighborhood that Gary Bertier lived in, and, you know, the cop pulls up, and you can see he, he gets all tense and freaked out. Um, he thinks he's going to get in trouble. There's no law that says an African-American can't walk down that street, but in early 1970s Virginia, it was understood. African-Americans don't walk in that neighborhood, right? And so a lot of parts of America had what we call de facto segregation, segregation that was enforced just by understood custom. Um, another one that I can give you from my own family um, experience, my father, when he was in the Air Force in Arizona in the 1950s, and this would be post Brown v. Board, um, he went to go watch a movie with an African-American airman, um, a friend of his, and they were told um, quite brutally, I'm not going to use all the racial terms, uh, that that young man was not allowed to go in the movie theater that it was for whites only. Uh, and he was wearing a United States Air Force uniform. And again, that is Arizona. 
that is not Arkansas or Alabama. Uh, they had segregation in Tucson, Arizona, apparently in the 1950s. So, and again, it was de facto. It was not a law. It just it was understood. Now, I don't want you to think that you know the case of Brown v. Board is where it all started. People had been challenging Jim Crow and segregation almost as soon as it was created. In 1909, the creation of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People had begun pushing court cases to try and overturn segregation, and they had had some successes. In 1935, the Supreme Court had ruled in the case of Norris v. Alabama that Alabama's law, which excluded African Americans from serving on juries, violated their right to equal protection under the law of the 14th Amendment. 1946, the court ruled in the case of Morgan v. Virginia that the segregation on interstate buses was unconstitutional. Um, they based that just on the concept of that would be a state regulating interstate commerce, and that's not their right. And in 1950, there was a ruling uh, in Sweet v. Painter that state law schools had to admit qualified African-American applicants even if there was a black law school in the state. Matter of fact, my American government class does a little more research. Um, there were a number of cases involving law schools around this time period, um, and Sweet versus Painter was one. And, and there, there was there was a school for um, for Black Americans in that state who wanted to study law, but it was it was inferior to the state white law school. Um, and this man sued for the right to attend it, and he won his case in 1950. Now, winning in the courts is one thing. There is another aspect to all this, politics. African Americans were enjoying um, a newfound political power or voice, um, more so than they'd ever had before. And it can be traced back to a couple things. One, the Great Migration. Now, you might remember the Great Migration refers to the movement or the shift of large numbers of African Americans from the deep rural south into uh, northern cities where they tried to, to acquire some of the more industrial job openings that became available during the First World War. Okay, so they left the Deep South where there was Jim Crow and there were actual laws that prevented an African American from voting, and they moved to northern cities. There might be racism in the North, and there might be de facto segregation in the North, but there are no laws that actually prevent an African American from voting. Unlike the South, where they actually had ways of preventing um, a man from, from casting his vote, in the North, no such laws really existed. So they moved to a part of the country where they could now vote. They were living in larger um, groups, more concentrated groups, and we've talked about this before. It means that they are able to affect county elections, you know, mayor elections. They might actually be able to affect who gets elected to the House of Representatives in the district. Okay, so their strength in numbers, but also as we are previously learned, they had switched to the Democratic Party thanks to the efforts of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He had won over the African-American vote for the Democratic Party, taking it away from the Republican Party, and that was very important because most of the South was Democrat at that time. So now all of a sudden Democratic politicians were having to walk an interesting tightrope. Well, Southern ones didn't have to. They, they were going to stick to their guns, but if you were a Northern Democratic politician… You now need the votes of these newly moved into town African-American Democrat voters. You're not going to win those votes by supporting segregation or racist policies. So what you find is all of a sudden the Democratic Party, which was once united, kind of in its pro-segregation stance, there now was like half the Democratic Party was against segregation and half of it was for it, which means it's not going to be as well supported. Now… It was during World War II that a, a number of African-American leaders decided that it was time for them to try and demand more rights in an effort to end some discrimination. Uh, as we learned about in our chapter on World War II, there actually was an executive order issued during World War II to end discrimination in the hiring of defense plant workers. But Mr. James Farmer and George Hauser 
1942 in Chicago started the Congress of Racial Equality, or as it was known, CORE. CORE wanted to integrate or desegregate areas that had de facto segregation. Again, there's no law. It's just you've got to get people to integrate, right? You're not you're not actually breaking a law. You're breaking down tradition, custom, culture. And so they wanted to basically try and desegregate like restaurants or hotels or things of that nature. And they decided to use a tactic that had been used by union auto, or automobile workers trying to get unions, the sit-in. And so what you started to see in 1943 and 44 is basically sit-in protest, which would take place at restaurants, hotels, again, some you know movie theaters, whatever, um, in places like Chicago, Detroit, Denver. And basically they were trying to shame or embarrass business owners into just integrating their facilities. And it worked by and large in a few areas. I mean, Chicago, Detroit, Denver, Syracuse, all of them by the end of World War II had pretty much desegregated large segments of their public facilities um, from de facto segregation. It's not to say they were completely victorious. There were still a lot of issues, um, especially in Detroit, uh, but they had had some success in desegregating certain aspects of those cities. <clears throat> now, the most famous moment, though, the, 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 the real lightning rod, so to speak, for it all, was the ruling of Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas. Now, before we get into Brown versus Board in, in great detail, this map shows you segregation in public schools in America prior to the Brown v. Board ruling. Um, there are 17 states that require segregated schools. It is required. It is state law that white and African-American children could not attend the same school. So 17, all of them in the Confederacy or border states, um, require it. 16 states forbid it. So there were 16 states that actually outlawed segregation. There were a handful, four, states that had optional or limited segregation. Um, it was not a statewide thing. Maybe it was up to individual school districts or counties or whatever. You know, it, it, it varied. And then there are a handful who also just have no legislation. I don't know what, what the deal is there. I really can't tell you. Um, but more states had segregation than outlawed it <laughs> at the time. Okay, so after World War II, the NAACP realized that they needed to continue to challenge segregation in the courts. Uh, remember, all these men came home from World War II. They fought for their country. You know, they served with distinction, and they they were not about to tolerate any more of this foolishness. And the NAACP had learned court cases were a wonderful way to win. Politicians are hard to win. All right, it's hard to get a politician to stick their neck out. It's hard to get a politician to take a risk. Courts don't care. Judges don't care. They look at the case, they look at the law, they issue a ruling, done. And so the NAACP was focused on trying to get court cases, right? Get things in the court system and they could win in court. From 1931 to 1961, the NAACP's chief counsel and director of their legal defense and education fund was Thurgood Marshall, um, who, if you're wondering, will eventually become the first um, African American to serve on the United States Supreme Court. Um, but in 1954, a case was finally able to get before the U.S. Supreme Court, um, thanks to the efforts of the NAACP and Thurgood Marshall. It is known as Brown v. Board. Um, it's actually Brown, Linda Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas, et al., which is a fancy Latin way of saying and others. It's actually a class action lawsuit. Another topic that actually we just covered um, yesterday in my American government class. Class action lawsuit is a lawsuit where you got several cases all kind of rolled into one because it's basically the same case, just different people, right? It's the same circumstance, just different places. Um, and so there were actually five cases, five children who were all in the same situation as Linda Brown. Um, the reason why Linda Brown is remembered or why it's known as Brown versus Board. Brown was the first last name in the class action lawsuit, so it came at the beginning. 
But really quickly, Linda Brown lived in Topeka, Kansas, and she was not allowed to attend the local all-white school um, in her neighborhood. Instead, she had to go all the way across town to an all-black school, you know, requiring a long journey on a public bus and and all that other. And and of course, the school was not exactly up to the same standard as the white school. Um, the NAACP and her parents sued the Topeka School Board. On May 17, 1954, the United States Supreme Court ruled unanimously, unanimously, that segregation in public schools was unconstitutional. They said that it violated the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. Uh, Chief Justice Earl Warren went on in his decision to state that in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. Separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. I will also go ahead and say um, a big part of the argument made by the Supreme Court was that th they actually looked at um, studies done by psychologists, and they had determined that segregation created a sense of inferiority um, and substandard in beliefs in African-American children. Um, it basically ingrained or convinced them they weren't as good. And basically, the Supreme Court argued that this was causing irreparable damage to these children, um, and it served no no real purpose. They, you couldn't justify it. You know, they're like, you're hurting these kids, and you can't really show me a positive or justify it in any way. We have to stop it. Oh, by the way, the 14th Amendment also says you can't do this. Um, so it, they really attacked it. And as I said, it was unanimous. It was unanimous striking down of the Plessy v. Ferguson ruling. The Brown decision was, of course, a dramatic reversal, um, and it, it's going to spread quickly because you think about it, if you can't segregate public schools, what can you segregate? Nothing. I mean, if you can't justify it in a public school, you can't justify it anywhere else in public, right? And everybody kind of realized this is the beginning of the end of segregation. Um, but many white Southerners, particularly, um, were determined to defend and uphold segregation. Their entire society, its you know, their entire social system had been built around it. Now, some school districts integrated without much trouble, um, but some fought tooth and nail. Okay, schools tried to find all sorts of loopholes and ways around it, right? Um, for one problem, the Brown v. Board ruling said that schools had to integrate with all deliberate speed. Now, when the Supreme Court says all deliberate speed, they mean as quickly as you can, but that's not what it says, right? And so schools, you know, deliberate speed depended on the eye of the beholder. And so some school districts were taking their time and, you know, they were doing a lot of planning and talking and discussing and not a whole, you know, and they're like, well, we're working on it. You know, you can't rush us. And, and you know, they basically just drug their feet and they were like, yeah, well, take us to court. Um, some school districts tried to get around it by creating all sorts of new rules and regulations that basically would maintain segregation, but not base it on race. Um, some states adopted pupil assignment laws, an elaborate set of rules and regulations that would basically prevent African Americans from attending the white schools. So, you know, they, they, they don't deny them the right to go to school because they're not white. They find all sorts of other rules and regulations that magically keep you from attending the school. Um, <clears throat> you know, one great example of resistance was the Southern Manifesto. In 1956, a group of 101 Southern members of Congress signed the Southern Manifesto where they denounced the Supreme Court's ruling and, and called for its reversal and demanded, you know, basically resistance. And they went on and on and on. And this is it. They went on. I, I did highlight how they wrote how we regard the decisions of the Supreme Court in the school cases as a clear abuse of judicial power. It climaxes a trend in the federal judiciary undertaking to legislate a derogation of the authority of Congress and to encroach upon the reserved rights of the states and the people. Um, okay, that's true. I guess maybe, except you're fighting for the right of your states to tell people they can't go to school with other people because of their race. Um, but hey, you know, I guess that's their right to write that. 
Um, this is just an angry letter, for those of you who are wondering. It doesn't do anything. Yes, it was signed by 19 senators and 77 members of the House of Representatives. And, okay, good for you. Um, it doesn't mean anything. It, it is literally an angry letter. This is an angry email to the Supreme Court. It doesn't mean anything. It's not a law. It's not an executive order. It's not legislation. It's not a bill. It's none of that. It's just a, we think this is garbage. Um, but the fact that you had all these congressmen sign on to this and basically call this bogus is pretty impressive. Now, um, <clears throat> In the while this was all going on, another drama was about to unfold. In Montgomery, Alabama, a young woman named Rosa Parks was arrested. She was arrested for refusing to move um, to get up from her seat on a Montgomery public bus. Um, in Montgomery, Alabama, there was a rule that basically said. Um, but there, there was a whites only section of the bus, right? And the back of the bus was reserved for African Americans. But the rule also said that if there were not enough seats in the white section, and a white person basically needed a seat, a white person could require an African American to give up their seat. Okay. Um, and so Rosa Parks is riding home from her job, and basically all the white seats white seats fill up um and you know there's a white guy who needs a seat and the bus driver um told rosa parks you don't give up your seat to this man and she refused and she was arrested for violating the montgomery bus services rule regarding you know seats and, and race and whatnot um when joanne robinson um head of a local organization called the women's political council heard about it um she called for a bus boycott she basically said that African-Americans in Montgomery should refuse to ride the city buses. Now, at first glance, you might go, okay, and, um, well, they were a large chunk of the business for the city bus network. And um, not to not to touch, not, not to mess with that touchy of a subject, but I think you guys are aware that boycotts can bring a lot of pressure on folks and can really upset the system and can lead to financial hardship. <laughs> and so basically they, these African-Americans were like, we're going to show them they need us. We don't need their buses. They need us. Um, and so they began boycotting Montgomery's buses. Now, it was an incredible success. Um, almost overnight, they started an association to run the boycott, and a young 26-year-old pastor in Montgomery, Alabama, who was the pastor at the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, um, named Martin Luther King Jr., became the leader. He became the leader of this boycott. Martin Luther King Jr. was an incredibly charismatic, eloquent young man, um, fiery, passionate preacher. He had a PhD in theology from Boston University. Um, he was a humongous believer in nonviolent protest tactics. He was primarily uh, inspired by Mohandas Gandhi. Gandhi was the man who basically got the British out of India. He got India its independence. Gandhi had also practiced nonviolence. Gandhi had found all sorts of ways to peacefully protest British rule in India and make the British look real bad, and basically the British eventually had to leave India. Um, Winston Churchill even one time basically blamed it all on Mohandas Gandhi. Um, <clears throat> one of the reasons why Martin Luther King Jr. felt that nonviolent tactics um, would be the best move and, and had to be used, not just because he's a Christian preacher, you know, and doesn't believe in violence or anything like that, um, but he understood that this was the best move for African Americans because, and I'm going to kind of relate it to the to the sit down strike that the workers had used previously, right? If there's violence, you're going to get blamed. That's what King said. You know, if there's violence, we're going to get blamed. The racists, the segregationists, they're going to blame us. Even if we didn't do it, they're going to blame us, right? And they run the newspapers, and they're in charge, and they're, you know, they're the governors, they're the police officers. They're, we're going to get blamed. If we're violent, 
we are going to suffer the consequences. We'll get blamed, and we'll play into all their stereotypes. You know, one of the stereotypes or justifications for why we had to have segregated schools is that the you know the poor, the the little sweet innocent white children could not be around the lawless you know savage African American children. Um, some of that just racist nonsense, and that's what King was saying though. He goes, if you if if you're violent, you're going to give them all the all the ammo that they need. They're going to use that as justification to keep segregation. We've got to be nonviolent um, and call attention to their behavior, and make them look like the bad guy. This is not fun. Um, not that being violent is fun, but you have to understand that he is asking people to basically turn the other cheek, which isn't exactly easy to do. Um, it's hard to do when people are, are taunting you with words. Imagine if people are getting physical with you and you're not allowed to fight back. Um, so this is going to become quite the battle for these people. Now, uh, I also want to mention, you know, he is, he is a, a minister. He was one of a number of ministers that were major leaders in this movement. Um, churches were instrumental in getting all this done. Why? They were the heart and soul of the African-American social community. They were really the only social community that existed. If you think about it, if you go back to, let's say, 1950 America, the only thing African Americans really had were their churches, their congregations. You know, There wasn't a whole lot else for them, socially speaking. There weren't ways to really organize, right? And then you think about leaders, leaders in the African American community. Think about college-educated African Americans. Think about respected African Americans. There weren't a lot um, because of the system that was in play in the United States at this time. You know, yes, you had you know, Jesse, um, you know, Jesse Owens, who you know, stunned everybody at the Berlin Olympics. You had Jackie Robinson. Um, you know, the, you had people like the Tuskegee Airmen. Yes, you had a few heroes here and there, but by and large, they're very rare, um, and they're not like they're in your everyday life. The only African Americans that probably had a college education in your community um, consistently were the ministers, and they were the respected ones, and they were the leaders of the community. And as we talked about during Reconstruction, churches are a safe place by and large. I mean, you've got to be really twisted to attack a church. And so churches were a way for these people to safely gather, get their stuff organized. I mean, to make a boycott effective, people have got to work together. People have got to cooperate, um, and and this boycott is a lot harder than maybe your all's experience because these people have to go places. You know, these people have jobs. They have doctor's appointments. They've got things they've got to do, and they were going to take the bus. So you had to organize the biggest carpool ever. Um, I want you to imagine basically thousands of people organizing their own kind of Uber. Um, but there's no cell phone, there's no email, there's no text. It's like we have church, and then after church, we'll spend an hour, and we'll basically go through who has to be where on what day, who has a car, who can drive, and we'll organize basically a ride-share program for the whole church congregation for the week. That's what they did. It was incredible, and they did it for weeks. Now, the African-American boycott of the buses lasted for over a year. Um, eventually Rosa Parks' um, her, her case worked its way through the Alabama court system uh, <clears throat> in December of 1956, uh, basically a year after she'd been arrested. A, the Alabama had a special uh, three-judge panel that declared Alabama's law requiring segregation on city buses to be unconstitutional. So she was actually vindicated and released and those laws were done away with, so they were successful. Um, the Montgomery bo bus boycott is what made Martin Luther King Jr. a leader, uh, the leader, I should say, of the civil rights movement. This, this took him from just a, another face in the crowd to the face of the civil rights movement, um, this success. And it wasn't long after the Montgomery bus boycott that other Christian ministers um, followed King's example, and they got together and they started the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. The idea was that they were going to work together to eliminate segregation across the South. Um, 
and again, they would use the power of the, of the churches to organize and motivate. You know, they would they would use the power of the ministers as leaders, and they were determined to try and and basically end the discrimination in voting, public transportation, housing. You know, you name it. But they were going to bring about racial equality. Now. During this time period, the President of the United States was Dwight Eisenhower. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower was originally from, I'm having a brain fart. Dwight Eisenhower was originally born in Texas. I would have been wrong. I was going to say Kansas for some reason. Um, he was originally born in Texas. That doesn't really mean a whole lot, actually. I mean, he, but once he you know, went to West Point, I don't know if he ever went back to Texas. Um, but he's originally from the South. But he was sympathetic with civil rights. You know, personally speaking, Eisenhower was a believer in civil rights. He had furthered the desegregation of America's military establishment. Harry Truman had actually desegregated the United States military, um, but Eisenhower desegregated shipyards, veterans' hospitals. And just in general, he believed in desegregation. He believed in civil rights. Um, but he was concerned about aggressively ending segregation, of rolling it back using you know, court rulings. Um, he believed that we had to – segregation had to gradually end, that this was something that had to die a sort of natural death in our culture. Um, you know, it, racism can't be ended with a court ruling. Right, the courts can say that white and African American children should go to school together. It doesn't mean it's going to work. And so Eisenhower kind of felt like we can't force this. We can we can push people in this direction, but we've got to let it occur naturally. So he was concerned about going too aggressively. And one of the big issues was we're in the midst of the Cold War. If you remember from our discussion of the Cold War with Dwight Eisenhower, and he was afraid that. If we push too hard on civil rights, it might divide the country. We might have protests. We might have violence. We might have riots and demonstrations, right? And America would look divided and weak, and the Russians would use that as a propaganda victory, right? Um, you know, you think about the Cold War. And we talked about this some, you know, those third world countries, you know, all those countries in, in Africa and Asia that really hadn't picked a side um, and were sort of up for grabs. In South America, that were up for grabs. We and the Soviets are trying to appeal to those people. And Eisenhower was afraid that if there were riots and violence in America, that the Soviets would be able to use that to their advantage and, you know, go all across the continent of Africa, winning allies by pointing, showing them newspaper articles of what we did to our African Americans, right? And so Eisenhower did not want to make America look weak and divided in the midst of this Cold War struggle. Um, on the same token, though, he believes it's his job to uphold the federal government's authority and to uphold and enforce court rulings. And that is why he became the first president since Reconstruction to use federal troops to protect the rights of African Americans in the South. And it all started in Little Rock, Arkansas. In September of 1957, the school board in Little Rock, Arkansas won a court order to admit nine African Americans to Central High. It's the school in downtown Little Rock. I mean, it is the major high school in downtown Little Rock. Had a student population of around 2,000 all white students. The school board announces that, you know, this year we're going to have nine African-American students. Little Rock was by and large racially moderate, as was all of Arkansas, really. Um, Arkansas was not hardcore deep south segregationist. Um, a number of communities had already desegregated. The University of Arkansas had already desegregated. You know, desegregation had already started to occur in Arkansas um, by 1957. The man who was the governor was Mr. Orville Favis. I've never heard of anyone having the first name Orville, spelled like that. But anyhow, Mr. Orville Favis, who had been a moderate on racial issues his whole political career, is up for re-election. And he decided that he was going to pin his re-election campaign on somehow magically becoming the defender of the white man and segregation. <laughs> and so kind of out of the blue, he becomes a champion of segregation. He ordered troops from the Arkansas National Guard to stop these nine African Americans from entering the school. 
the Little Rock Nine as they became known. National Guard troops surrounded the school, an angry white mob was there to also protest, and they were there to prevent the African American children from entering school. This was covered on national television, right? The newspapers were there, the TV stations were there. Um, a governor had used the state militia to oppose a federal court order, a Supreme Court order, no less. Yeah, this is the first time anybody's done this since the Civil War. Um, Eisenhower, not very happy. Um, and Eisenhower actually called Orville Faubus. They had a conference which moved them nowhere. Um, so then Eisenhower got a district court judge to issue a district court order for the governor to remove the troops or to be held in contempt. Um, and so he did. He said, yeah, fine. We're, we'll, okay, everybody pack up, go home. He sent the troops home. He didn't send the white mob home. He didn't break up the white mob that had gathered to protest the African-American students. He just sent all the National Guardsmen and cops home. Well, it turned into a, a riot, and a mob broke into the school, um, and they were basically running around the school trying to find these African-American children. Two African-American uh, reporters were badly beaten. Most of the windows in the school were broken. They almost got their hands on these African-American students, um, but they, uh, <clears throat> they were fortunately rescued by a few cops who had not abandoned their post and were able to get them out of there. Eisenhower was furious. Eisenhower called the 101st Airborne, which is stationed at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, down in southwestern Kentucky. Overnight, 1,000 soldiers from the 101st Airborne went to Little Rock, and the next morning, Little Rock was a military campground. Little Rock Central High, I should say. The front lawn of the school was a military camp. 1,000 soldiers had basically set up a camp at 5 a.m., they had formed a defensive circle around the school, and then units or groups of troops went to the houses of the students, picked them up, drove them to school, and escorted them throughout their school day. These nine children spent an entire school year with an armed, fully armed paratrooper by their side all day long. These kids always had an armed guard everywhere they went. If they went to the bathroom, an armed guard went with them to the bathroom, made sure the bathroom was clear, let them go in the bathroom, and then let anybody come in while they were in there. I mean, that's how strict they were on the security for these kids. And basically, that's how Little Rock was integrated. Um, it took troops from the 101st Airborne, basically, for the entire school year, right? Now... The same year of the Little Rock crisis was the year that the United States Congress passed a Civil Rights Act for the first time in a long time. And I don't know what is up with this text. This is weird. It looked very choppy. Let's try something different. There. All right, I don't know what's up with that. So, the Civil Rights Act of 1957, the first civil rights law since Reconstruction, post-Civil War. It was designed to protect the right of African Americans to vote. Eisenhower was a staunch believer in a person's right to vote, and he believed that it was his job as president to assure that every American citizen had their right to vote protected and enforced. Now, Eisenhower also was not a fool. He knew that if he got a civil rights bill to Congress, conservative Southern Democrats would try and block it. In 1956, he did send a bill to Congress hoping not only to split the Democratic Party, but to win some African-American voters over to the Republican Party again. You know, the whole, why are you guys voting Democrat when they vote against every civil rights bill we ever propose? The Civil Rights Act got another try here in 1957, right? So he tried to get one through in 56, more for political reasons than anything, but then he tried again in 57. Now, the key to getting a civil rights bill through Congress is you got to get the support of some Southern senators. And several Southern senators wanted to stop this. But the Senate Majority Leader was a Texan by the name of Lyndon Johnson. Lyndon Johnson was one of the most skilled Senate Majority Leaders ever. Okay, Lyndon Johnson was a master politician. Had a lot of other flaws, but he was an incredible politician, an incredible congressman. And he was able to work a compromise bill through the United States Congress. Now, I say compromise. It is a compromise. It is watered down. It is much weaker than what was originally intended. 
but it's the best you were going to get. What this did is it actually got the federal government in the game. This act created a civil rights division within the Justice Department, and it was this civil rights division's job to basically get court injunctions against anyone or any institution which interfered with a person's right to vote based on race. It also created the United States Commission on Civil Rights to investigate any allegations. Um, and again, it's the US federal government, just like Reconstruction. We're not gonna let the states have anything to say with this one, right? If you mess around, the FBI is gonna be knocking on your door, right? It's not gonna be the local sheriff. It's gonna be somebody from Washington. When this bill was finally passed, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference announced that they were going to try and register 2 million new African-American voters um, in the next year, right? Massive voter registration drive. Now in section two, um, we're gonna see this kind of move beyond um, just pushing for rights to vote and, and such, um, but that is your homework for next week.